Okay, uh, in the last lecture, uh, I've uh, explained to you uh, the basics of how folds form in the Earth. Folds are discontinuities, and the two parts of the fold, the two halves of this part of the Earth, are moved against each other. Today, we will talk about joints. Joints are also discontinuities, but here the rocks move apart. And I will first explain to you uh, why these two kinds of structures form. It is very easily and arrogantly explained by the Mohr circles, which we have learned about uh, before. But um, one thing that I forgot to tell you uh, last week is uh, why we have these three main classes of faults. Maybe you remember we have normal faults, We have reverse faults. And we have strike-slip faults, which are really three-dimensional structures. And the two halves have moved horizontally. So these are the normal faults, these are the reverse fault, and these are the strike slip. So you may now ask, why do we have these three main classes? And the reason is that the stress tensor, stress tensor sigma, that we have talked about to a great extent, has three principal directions, sigma 1, sigma 2, and sigma 3. If you plot this in normal space, you will get a stress ellipsoid, and the three main axes of the stress ellipsoid are sigma 1, sigma 2, and sigma 3. And because there are three in this list, we also have three in this list. The reason why that is so is given by the fact that a free surface cannot have a shear stress on it. So if I consider the surface of the Earth, the surface of the Earth cannot cannot contain a shear stress because, of course, there's air on this side, so there, there cannot be any shear stresses. Therefore, the surface of the Earth must be perpendicular to one of the principal stresses because the principal stress is acting on a plane exactly perpendicular. So, the conclusion is the Earth's surface, most of the time, has one of the principal stresses of this sigma perpendicular to it. And this was recognized by Anderson about 100 years ago. And he said, it is either sigma 1 or sigma 2 or sigma 3, which is perpendicular or vertical in the case of the Earth's surface. So now let's have a look at the diagram that I've shown you before. If we take a little block, sigma 1 is like this, sigma 3 is like this, and this block fails. This is what we see in many, many experimental deformation um, determination of how rocks fail in compression under stress. And in all the three situations, we can put this block into the Earth's surface. Okay? So either sigma 1 is vertical, and then our little block looks like this, and then we have 
normal folds. Or sigma 3 is vertical. <coughs> Our little block is like this. Sigma 1 is horizontal. And then we have the reverse fold. And the third case is that sigma 2 is vertical. And then it is a little bit more difficult to draw the situation we have something like this, because in the case of sigma 2, <coughs> of, of strike slip folds rather, sigma 2 is the one which is vertical. Three principal stresses, three major kinds of folds, the reason being that the surface of the Earth is one of the principal stresses ver uh, vertical. Okay. So far, so good. We have now seen that under compressive stress, as explained by this Moore diagram, which we have now seen many times, rocks will fail, form little faults, and this plane is one of these two planes. This is sigma 1, and this is sigma 3. These are effective stresses. And this is the normal stress. And this is the shear stress. And this explains faulting and the generation of faults in a very, very large parts of the Earth crust, where it is brittle. However, there is still one mode of failure, which this diagram as I have drawn it here, and has not explained. And this is my favorite classroom experiments. I take this piece of chalk as a model for a rock, and I pull on it. So now I'm actually trying to make it longer. Okay? I pull on it, and the piece of chalk fractures in extension. The two halves separate, separate, and the fracture itself is exactly perpendicular to the direction in which I pulled. So, what is now the state of stress in this stroke just before I fracture it? Well, here there is no effective stress in this direction because the air can go inside the pores of the choke. And here there is a clear tensile stress. So, the more circle is something like this. Okay, one end of the more circle is in the origin, and the other is negative. I'm pulling on the rock. And here I form a fracture at this point on the more circle, perpendicular to sigma 3. If you want, what you can do now is you can extend this line and make it look like this. And this is now the envelope which explains for us both the tension fractures and the shear fractures. So here, in this mode, sigma 3 is like this. It's negative. <coughs> Sigma 1 is 0, and then the rock will split and form an opening mode fracture like this. In between the two, there are transitions, and over, over those transitions we will talk in the advanced structural geology course and later also in the masters. But what is very important for us, that you can have these joints. You can have these opening mode fractures. And these can form in the earth. And they are, of course, major pathways for fluid flow because in an open fracture you can flow a lot of fluids. So, summarized, we have this more envelope here. We have the circles. And down here, if the circle is like this, then you form the extension fracture. And here you form the shear fractures. 
And here I've just put a num uh, very simple pictures of rocks which contain veins. And the veins are, of course, formed by the fact that you make a fracture open, you allow the fluid to flow in, and the fluid will crystallize a new material like quartz or calcite. And this is what I'm going to explain to you or talk to you about today. Okay. So, fractures, opening mode fractures, are very different from the faults, from the shear fractures that we find, and both occur in the earth crust. So let's first have a look at a few very spectacular looking opening mode fractures. Here is the first one. This is a sandstone in Utah, close to Arches National Park. And this red sandstone has fractured. This whole outcrop is defined by enormous, very, very flat planar fractures. So this is a fracture plane, this is a fracture plane, this is a fracture plane here. This is a fracture also, which has now opened. Okay, and here another fracture is coming out to the surface. And you can already see that there is a little discoloration telling us that there has been some fluid flow and some differential crystallization of iron oxides. And these fractures are a pathways for fluid flow. They make the rock permeable and also prone to erosion. And the erosion along fractures can cut really deeply into the earth. In this picture I've, uh, I made in Oman, in the Oman mountains, where a very thick limestone has been cut by a fracture, and the erosion has gone several hundreds of meters down and it has formed this slot canyon, it is called. And the bottom there is still water, and this slot canyon is basically the erosional product of a fracture which makes the earth prone to erosion. The next extremely spectacular uh, example of fractures is uh, from the desert in Utah. This is Monument Valley. You probably all know these pictures from the Lucky Luke uh, cartoon strips. Um, and these towers here are the remnants of a sandstone layer which was deposited there and then eroded away uh, along fractures. You can see the fractures here cutting through the sandstone layer and this is simply the tower and this is another one which has been left over by the erosion. The joints are the controlling parameters for the formation of this landscape. Another very spectacular example of joints controlling the morphology um, is in mountain belts where you have granite massives so this is a huge granite massive with a face of over 1,000 meter in the Himalayas. And this face is basically one fracture. The granite has fractured in this mode and the glaciers have taken away one half of the fracture and exposed the rock. Okay, so fractures can be very beautiful and they have a huge control on morphology development in many parts of the earth. But if you go and look a little closer, then you will find that fractures are not always completely smooth. They have a lot of details in their morphology. And you can learn a lot by looking at these fractures. Um, I have put as a title of this graph, Fractography. Fractography is a subject that you can study at a university. And it basically studies fractures and how fractures form and in which morphology. Fractures are not only important in geoscience, they are also important in many uh, parts of engineering. In engineering, a fracture is bad. If something breaks, then maybe an aeroplane falls out of the sky. And there are departments in research institutes which are basically focused on, on looking and studying fractures in failed machine parts. Because if you look at the fracture, you can tell a lot about how it happened. So, for example, if an airplane crashes, they want to know why it crashes, why something has broken. And by looking at the fracture, you can actually understand what has happened. So here is a fracture in a sandstone just close to Aachen. And you are now looking on 